It's a justice-themed week here on the podcast as we hear from two former U.S. attorneys. First, what kind of work does a U.S. attorney do? Preet Bharara will be here to talk about his new book, Doing Justice. How did the 1963 Birmingham church bombing change the course of the civil rights movement? Author and Senator Doug Jones will join us to discuss. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, our critics will talk about the latest in literary criticism. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. I'm Pamela Paul. Preet Bharara joins us now. His new book is called Doing Justice, A Prosecutor's Thoughts on Crime, Punishment, and the Rule of Law. Preet, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I love having the meta podcast, you know, where I have another <laughs> podcast host so we can we can compare notes. But if people don't know about your podcast, if they know nothing else about you, what they know is this, that you were the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, that you were told by Donald Trump personally that you were going to keep your job, and two and a half months later, you yeah, were it was fired. November thirtieth, and I was fired on March eleventh. I think it was. Someone had a change of heart, I guess. Yes. So you could potentially write an entire book, sort of off of that. You did not do that. I did not. You did not do that. I know that you were actually approached to write this book before all of that happened, or to write a book. Well, people have been talking to me about writing a book for some time. I think after I got fired. And a lot of people thought I I could write a book about my experiences, about Trump, I guess, about, you know, what happened to me, the fact that the president-elect called me, and then when he became president, he called me. I refused to return the call. The next day I was asked to resign. I don't know if those things are connected. They seem highly unlikely not to be connected. But but that's not the book I wanted to write. I, I wanted to tell about the Southern District and about how justice is done and take a step back. You know, I, I have Twitter to talk about the president and his daily machinations and my podcast as well. Stay tuned. But if I was going to sit down and write a full volume about justice and what I've been doing for much of my adult life, I want it not to just be about Trump, 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 because I think we do that too much sometimes. And it's important to take a step back and talk about first principles and, you know, what makes justice work, what makes justice happen, what makes justice not work, what does truth mean as opposed to truth not being truth, and what are real facts as opposed to alternative facts. And then you compare what the right way of doing things is to how far we've fallen, I think, from the ideal. And I do it through telling a lot of stories. So it's a, hopefully it's a page turning thing because we did a lot of different kinds of cases, including terrorism cases, mob cases, public corruption cases, insider trading cases. We even had a case involving a so-called cannibal cop. But there are lessons in all those cases, I think, not just for lawyers, but for people generally who have any kind of discretion in any job that they do, or even, you know, the way they deal with family issues at home. So you resisted that urge to kind of turn this book into the sort of my experiences with Trump, my take on Trumpism, and to... No, I I wanted to talk about my experiences with justice and my experiences with fairness and, you know, telling stories of how sometimes it didn't work. And, you know, that's relevant, obviously, to what's going on today. But I didn't want it to make it Trump. I feel like sometimes when you talk about Trump and you invoke the name, people immediately have some kind of, you know, reaction if they're fans of his. They tune out. Mm -hmm. If they're not fans of his... You know, they salivate maybe a little too much. Right. And we should separate what I think is the right way of going about doing things, keeping an open mind and and caring about facts and evidence and expertise, all of which seem to be lost these days. Talk about those things on their own. And then you can see how that relates to the current time. But just invoking Trump in every sentence, and I don't begrudge people who have done that in books, but this is a different book. So how did you decide to structure this book on justice? Because there are a lot of ways that you could have gone about yeah. it. So a lot of the chapters are just sort of relate to one story. You know, there might be a story about a baby who was kidnapped and how the career folks in my office decided to deal with the emotional trauma of that on the part of, you know, the kidnapped baby and to get justice in the case. Or a story, as I mentioned, of of a cop who aspired to be a cannibal. And, you know, was that a thought crime? Do they go beyond a thought crime? And there are other chapters that deal generally with sort of an issue, like how to interrogate, Mm -hmm. how to get information from people. And as I say in the book, if you watch a lot of movies, you have a skewed view of how effectively you can get people to tell you things and, and get their secrets. And I say, you know, in the real world where testosterone does not flow in, this, in the streets like a river. Really? I'd say, <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? It's, it's a, you know, I had a flourish there. But a lot of people think you beat the hell out of somebody, you torture them, you use enhanced interrogation techniques, you threaten them. And no investigator that I know thinks that that's effective. Mm-hmm. In fact, you build rapport and I tell some stories of grizzled, 
veteran, hardcore, tough investigators who figure out, you know what, this is the way you lull someone into telling you things. You don't threaten them. I had a cop say to me once that you know, people think it's his badge and his gun that causes someone to confess or tell, or tell him stuff. He's like, no, those are obstacles mm-hmm. to getting information from someone. So, so the structure of the book is I have some stories, I have some themes, but overall it, it traces the arc of any case. So I have a number of stories and chapters about the, the investigative, you know, the inquiry part mm-hmm. of, of any case, and then the phase of a case where you decide whether or not to accuse, you know, bring a charge. Then third, the phase of judgment. How do you prove someone is guilty of something? And then finally, and maybe with most difficulty, the phase of punishment, how you get proper punishment. You know, people associate you, obviously, with not only the Trump incident, but also with major cases handled by the Southern District's office having to do with white collar crime, having to do with corruption, with terrorism. And yet, in terms of the book itself, you bookend doing justice with two very human stories at the beginning, the Menendez brothers, and then at the end, with another kind of small scale human story yeah. of, of 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 attempted murder in the second case. And throughout, I think I'm telling stories about people. A theme of the book and of my time as U.S. attorney was that you can draft great laws and you can be very particular about how statutes are written and rules and regulations at companies and in life, but that doesn't assure justice. That justice is done by people and people who are thoughtful and deliberate and who do the right thing for the right reasons in the right way every day, which was a, you know, a motto of our office and, a, and, and the mission of our office, as we would say all the time to the young prosecutors. But people forget sometimes that everyone is a human being, and you have to understand that you know, there are witnesses who are scared. Will they testify? You don't learn how to get them to testify from a book. The judges are human beings too. They wake up on the wrong side of the bed sometimes. They have egos. They have professional responsibilities and professional ambitions as well. And that's, that's incredibly important. I, I quote early in the book something that I heard in a, in a, that I memorized in a, in a summation by Clarence Darrow back in the 1920s that made the point that there's a difference between justice and law. And sometimes the law is not enough. And it's necessary for people to do the right thing under the law, even if the law is well written. And he would say, he said in the summation, in the case of the people versus Henry Sweet, no matter what laws we pass, no matter what precautions we take, unless the people we meet are kindly and decent and human and liberty loving, then there is no liberty. Freedom, he says, comes from human beings rather than from laws and institutions. And so we say we're a nation of laws, but how justice is done is through the stories of human interactions with people, whether it's defendants or judges or prosecutors or defense lawyers or witnesses or the family members of any of those people. And that's what I was trying to convey in the book. Well, I want to talk specifically about that Menendez anecdote because it's really powerful. And it's a case, you know, as you point out, at the time in the 80s, it was probably second only to O.J. Simpson as the sort of gripped the nation, the story of these two brothers who murdered their parents. Yeah, yeah, their parents. But you tell it for a reason, not not because of the grisliness of the crime. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and I wasn't involved in the case personally. You know, I, I wanted to tell a story of something from before my time as a lawyer. The, the homicide or the parricide happened in the summer of 1989. And I was uh, still in college at the time. And my best friend from high school, Jessica Goldsmith, I had heard about this family because she was friends with the family, Jessica's parents were the best friends of Jose and Kitty Menendez. So over the course of high school, I had heard about their visits and I had heard about the Menendez family who had become very successful and they'd moved out to California. And one day she calls me crying and she says, Jose and Kitty have been killed. And not only were they killed, they were slaughtered with shotguns. So everyone thought it was a mob hit, perhaps. And it was many months before we understood what had happened. And one day she called me and I'm just relating this human story of dealing with a good friend, not a legal story who calls and says, you know, they arrested the boys and the boys couldn't have done it. And I said, are you sure? And she says, no, I'm, I'm sure they could not have done it. I mean, she grew up with these kids. You know, they, they, they lived, the parents lived together for a period of time in New York City. And then a few months more go by and it turns out the boys did it. And Jessica's family got word first, I think from the attorney for the Menendez brothers who were, were changing their plea, I think, to, to self-defense or insanity based on physical and sexual abuse that they claimed at the hands of the father. And we stayed up all night that night. And I was prepared to talk about the legal implications. She was not interested in talking about how much time will they face? What's the proper defense? Do you think they'll get convicted? She she wanted to know, in a a bit of self-introspection, how she got it wrong. Mm -hmm. How could you be so wrong? And, And the lesson for me was, you know, shattering as it was for a young person, although it seems obvious as I'm older, 
that you never really know anyone for sure. Mm -hmm. And you never really know what people are capable of. Some people are not aware of what they themselves are capable of if put in certain circumstances. And it has always stuck with me. And it's, it's illuminating in a certain line of work that I entered later in the job of investigating and, and showing whether people are, are guilty or not guilty of something. That when people say, you know what, that, that guy didn't do it. I think of the Menendez brothers. And I think sometimes they did. This was obviously an incredibly dark story, and a lot of the things that you dealt with as a prosecutor are really grim situations that show human beings at their worst. And yet, this book, and I think elsewhere, you convey a sense of hope in human good and faith in human good. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of startling. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an interesting paradox. The Southern District of New York is an interesting paradox in that. You see the worst that humanity has to offer every day. You sit there, and depending on what you specialize in in the prosecutor's office, you're looking at child trafficking, you're looking at child pornography, you're looking at kidnapping, you're looking at robbery, you're looking at homicides, you're looking at people who want to you know, kill Americans, as, as many as they can, who steal people's life savings. So it's, it's terrible stuff that you have to deal with. But the people there are all idealistic and are inspired to, to do something good and to make the community better. And so that... That, uh, that juxtaposition of terrible stuff along with really great people is deeply inspiring to me. And they go at it every day. And there are people there who uh, you know, give up a lot of other financial uh, benefit and not go to a law firm and give up literally, in some cases, seven-figure salaries. I've enticed people to come back to that office giving up seven-figure salaries. You know, how many people do that in the name of public service? And I think you know, their story should be, should be told. What you did there and in your previous roles, whether at Justice or elsewhere, I mean, these things had consequences. You are like very clearly defined uh, results of the work that you do. What you're doing now, maybe not quite as much. I mean, do you miss it? You mean the talking? (laughs) Yes. The podcast hosting, writing books, you know, the being a part of the media. Yeah, it's a softer kind of service. You know, I, I could have decided like pretty much every one of my predecessors to go to a white shoe law firm and do criminal defense work. Uh, you know, I had this opportunity. I had a different platform and an opportunity to, you know, talk to people, explain to people. I started this podcast, Stay Tuned, without a lot of expectation. And it has taken off and become multiple times more successful than our wildest dreams. And I think that's in part because there are people who are thoughtful and civic-minded and care about the country and are not lawyers. And they want to understand in layperson's terms, what does all this mean? What is the 25th Amendment? mean? What does impeachment mean? What is obstruction of justice? What does it mean for a witness to flip? And so coincidentally, I had this opportunity to write a book that that explains a lot of it. And I've been interested when people say to me, you know, we really appreciate what you have to say. You turn on cable television these days, and half the time I look up at the screen, it's someone who used to work for me. (laughs) You know, federal prosecutors, particularly those from the Southern District, given the Michael Cohen investigation, are in great demand because people want to understand how the law works and how it's supposed to work. And so, no, it's not the same as having subpoena power, <laughs> so, but, it's, but it's gratifying. Like any public figure, you are also often the subject of scrutiny or observation by the media, and that is never always a pleasant experience. And there's one chapter in your book, I think, where you address it specifically called Bollywood. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. <laughs> I was going to have a chapter in the book called Witch Hunt, but then I figured it was, it was too staid because he— It's like we, calling we, a chapter huge. <laughs> we, taken. We, we, yeah, it's, people have had enough of that. When people try to find some excuse for complaining about the prosecution, the one that was particularly odd for me, and the reason the, the title of the chapter is Bollywood, is, is I'm Indian American, proudly. I'm proud of my heritage and roots, but I'm an American, and I was the United States attorney. And by happenstance, you know, some of the people we prosecuted were prominent, were of Indian descent also. And some people thought that, well, that must be because Preet's a self-hating, trying-to-be-white prosecutor, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. And you know, someone in the Wall Street Journal once wrote, about this big insider trading case we did against Raj Rajaratnam, who's from Sri Lanka, also part of South Asia. And the line in the article I thought was crazy, and it said something like, what a coincidence you have the target in the case, the defendant in the case, hails from South Asia, and the prosecutor in the case, Preet Bharara, also hails from South Asia. It's like a scene out of a Bollywood movie. <laughs> like, yeah, I, what? And, and I, I speculate, you know, imagine if someone had written about my predecessor. You know, it's an amazing coincidence. The defendant is a notorious alleged fraudster named Bernard Madoff, who is Jewish. And the acting attorney, a U.S. attorney, Lev Dassin, is also Jewish. It's like a scene out of Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> I think the person would have been out of employment right then. But there's this, there's this, there's this weird disconnect 
when you're talking about, you know, what the right thing is and what people perceive the motivations are, and you have to suck it up. Going back to your South Asian heritage, you were born in India, your parents immigrated from India, and India is a place that in somewhat in contrast to the U.S., I think that people get a sense of corruption on a kind of really daily personal level. Yeah. Did your, <laughs> did, did, was that the experience of your parents? Did that have any effect on sort of your development of your sense of, of, of justice and your desire to pursue it as uh, an application? No one's ever asked me that question. So maybe I've never given this answer. So my father's a pediatrician. I, I still think, and he was the first person out of 13 members of, you know, 13 brothers and sisters uh, all together. First one to go to college in his family. Um, in the home where his family lived when I was a kid living in America, we'd go back and visit, you know, no, no the toilets. Uh, so he didn't come from much. And I think when you're a great student in India at the time, when he was growing up in the 50s and 60s, you become a doctor if you're, you know, terrifically smart, like my dad is, or an engineer. Uh, the path to law was not as smiled upon. And the reason I say that is I think my dad would have become a lawyer had he grown up in America because he has very strong views about principle and about uh, fairness. And he would say, even though he was not in politics, that he would see corruption, uh, you know, and petty corruption all around. And one of the reasons, I mean, the main reason he, he left the country and came to the United States was for a better life and more opportunity for him and his wife and me and my brother later. But another reason was he saw, he saw corruption. And, you know, it's, it's a noted problem, no disparagement on the, the country of my birth. And, and maybe it's gotten better, maybe it's gotten worse. But there was a lot of petty corruption all over the place, even in hospitals and even in medical offices. And he didn't like it. And he would talk about it when we were kids. And it always stuck with me. Speaking of corruption, corruption is, is a word that's bandied about all the time now. Under this current administration, some people view it as corrupting our institutions, you know, down to the level of the, obviously, the Department of Justice, but also throughout the courts. And I'm curious in terms of the focus of your book, as you're going through the various ways in which the justice system works, how much did you want to focus on, well, this is how it should work. Here's how it did work in practice when I was involved in it. And then kind of this is what's happening now in contrast, perhaps, to all of that. I think throughout the book, I'm, I'm both descriptive and normative. And those things are not unrelated to each other. I mean, part of the reason I don't want to talk about Trump and say, well, here's all the things that are terrible that are happening with Trump, which is sort of normative and delving into what you think is corrupt and, and undermining of institutions. But there's another way to do that, which I thought was more powerful for the purposes of this book which is to be descriptive about uh, ideally how it's done by talking about all these stories and cases and doing you know, a deep sort of dive on what the feelings and thoughts of the prosecutors were and the defendants and the, the human beings who were involved in them so that you get a good sense of, well, oh, wow, that, that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's done in the best way, which provides you with the backdrop, I think, to be able to make the critique about the current state of corruption. So you, you talk about the way that things are done in an ideal world and examples of those done successfully. And that the contrast between that and what's happening now can in some ways speak for itself. There's a recurrent phrase that you use on your podcast, um, which is just a kind of restrained, you know, which is worrying, which <laughs> might be a, a, an understatement. I'm curious now, especially viewing this somewhat from the outside, what is it that worries you right now about what's going on under the current administration, I would say specifically with regard to justice and the law, what keeps you up at night? It's a little bit to, to, to plug another book, which I reviewed in the New York Times recently by David McCraw called The Truth in Our Times. It's the undermining of truth. It's, it's a soft thing. And it's, it's just as important to law enforcement and to legal institutions as it is to the media. And, and for both reasons, it's incredibly undermining of democracy. I had Gary Kasparov on my podcast, and we have become friends since, and he has some experience with totalitarian regimes and the use of propaganda. And he says, you know, the, the clever propagandist and, and aspiring autocrat does not say that everything that is uttered that is negative is false and doesn't have sort of a purely run state media. What you do is you undermine the truthfulness of everything. And you say, there's, there is no real truth. Truth isn't truth, as Rudy Giuliani famously put it. There can be such a thing as alternative facts. So it's not that a person necessarily thinks, well, it's the opposite of whatever the New York Times reports, but that over time, you can have no faith that anything that anybody says is truthful. So it doesn't matter so much that a lot of people think what comes out of the mouths of pro-Trump outlets or pro-Trump people may be false. You create enough confusion that the truth is undermined you know, overall. 
And it allows anyone to say about anyone and any outlet and any particular journalist and any particular article, well, that's made up. All right. Here's one question. Last question, maybe a little bit about the truth versus exaggeration. But I have to know, because you have said repeatedly, and I think wrote in the book, that writing a book was the hardest thing you've ever done. Yeah. You've done some pretty hard things. Not as hard as this. In terms of in terms of labor and stress, look, the, the consequences, you have to separate two things, right? So I, so I did things when I was U.S. attorney whose stakes were extraordinary and much higher than the stakes of this book. You know, if, if we did something wrong in a case, it potentially implicates someone's liberty and life and safety of the public. Here, the only thing that's implicated is my own is my own ego, <laughs> if no one reads the book or if everyone hates the book. But in terms of, of sheer labor, you know, I spent, I spent more hours on this thing and this thing of length than, than anything I've ever done. And, you know, I cared about every word I wrote about. You know, a lot of people suggested... There's someone like me, if you're a former official, you can get someone to ghostwrite it for you. Or, or help. And I resisted all of that. I wanted to write everything myself. Did uh, that feel dishonest to you in a way? Well, it, it may be a sign of arrogance because I, 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 I thought I was a decent writer. Uh, I wrote all my, my, all my own speeches when I was in office. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything you see me say, it's, it's out of my own mouth. I'm not scripted on the podcast. I just, I just feel no one is going to be able to say what I want to say. Maybe other people could say it more elegantly, but it's not going to be as, as much from me and mm-hmm. my heart if other people say it. And... It's you know book book writing. I think anything of length is is difficult in a, in, a, in a different way. So I had this working theory as I was writing the book. Lots of restaurants have good appetizers, but to sustain a great meal through the appetizer and then the main course and the dessert is more difficult. Lots of people can write an article, but to sustain a book is different. You know, lots of movies have great opening scenes, but to sustain it for two hours in an arc that is paced properly is a much different thing. And that's what I struggled with with the book a little bit. I also struggled with figuring out which stories to tell and which stories not to tell. There's lots of famous cases we did, including Russian spies and homicides and weird, you know, crazy, brutal assassination cases. They're not in the book. Maybe I'll have a second book. That's right, the cutting room floor Be- book. Because there, it was it was too much. I mean, we we oversaw so much, like the richness. I mean, people will get a sense of what the Southern District is like. People will say, "What was your favorite case?" or "What did you focus on?" We had so many great people focusing on so many different things. But the breadth is extraordinary. I would forget about cases. Like, oh, I forgot about that case because there's so much. And also the difficulty for me was wanting to write a book that's not for lawyers, but that lawyers would appreciate mm-hmm. and is not you know, talking down to anyone. And that is page turning. So a combination of stories and thoughts and ruminations to weave together. It would have been easy to write a law book. It would have been easy to write a pure memoir. I'm not in a lot of the book. It's about other people who did heroic things. I didn't. They did. So that was it, was, it was tough. Well, I can reassure you, having spoken to a few other authors about these issues, that you are not alone okay, in your good. concerns. But here's to people reading the book and not hating the book. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. The book, again, is called Doing Justice, A Prosecutor's Thoughts on Crime, Punishment, and the Rule of Law by Preet Bharara. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Joining us now from Washington, Senator Doug Jones of Alabama, author of a new book, Bending Toward Justice, The Birmingham Church Bombing That Changed the Course of Civil Rights. Senator Jones, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And I should say that your co-author is Greg Truman, and you have a foreword by Rick Bragg, a former Times man. Let's start with the Birmingham Church bombing. What happened? It was September 15, 1963, a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church, and it killed four young African-American girls. The church had been a focal point of the civil rights movement in Birmingham. Earlier that year, you had seen a number of demonstrations, uh, marches. They were known as the Children's Marches that occurred in Birmingham in the spring of 1963. There were a lot of images from that 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 people still remember of fire hoses and the dogs where our police commissioner, Bull Connor, uh, attacked the kids that were were marching. And most of the meetings, they started at the 16th Street Baptist Church. That was the main meeting point. And when they settled that 
that church really became a target of the Klan. And over the course of the next few months, as, as desegregation came into effect and the Birmingham City Schools saw uh, court orders to desegregate the schools, people in Birmingham, particularly the Klan, was not happy about that. They were seeing their segregated way of life sliding away. And all of a sudden, this bomb was planted as a show of force. And it exploded in the early morning hours between Sunday school and church, just outside the ladies' lounge where these girls were getting ready for what was going to be a youth worship service. And it killed four, injured some others. There was a fifth little girl in the ladies' lounge that day who was was hurt pretty badly, but she survived. These were girls that were between the ages of 11 and 14? Yes. And their names, uh, you know, I always like to remember their names. It was Denise McNair and Cynthia Morris Wesley and Carol Robertson and Addie Mae Collins were killed. Addie Mae's sister, Sarah, was also there and she survived. So this was an era in which there were a number of atrocities like this that took place in the South as the civil rights movement was sort of really beginning to to take hold. What made this particular attack and murder different from others? I think it was a combination of things. Number one, it was children. Mm -hmm. These children had not participated in in the demonstrations. They weren't out throwing rocks or creating any kind of disturbance. They were just young girls getting ready for a worship service, which I think is the second part of why this just really rocked everybody's world, and that was this was a house of worship. There had been bombings and and other bombings in Birmingham, but now you've got a bombing in a house of worship where people were there gathering to worship in what should have been one of the safest places they could be, and it took these four lives. And I think it was that combination simply because of the color of their skin and because the church had been a focal point of the movement, I think it really opened up a lot of hearts and minds to the fact that the Jim Crow laws, which was America's version of apartheid, was wrong, and we got to do something about it. What was the reaction like in the community at the time, as well as nationwide? I mean, how much publicity did this get? Did the media sort of descend? What was the reaction? Well, it it really gathered a lot of media attention for the time. I mean, it is obviously not like it is today where you've got a 24-hour news cycle and hundreds of different media outlets, both on television, radio, newspaper, as well as the Internet. But it gathered a lot of media attention across the world. I think the shockwaves of this bombing went far beyond the city of Birmingham and and Alabama, all across the country and across the world as people just asked the question of why could this happen. So there was an incredible amount of media attention. In Birmingham, there was the shock. There was the expressions of remorse. But unfortunately, those expressions didn't really translate itself into affirmative action to try to get something done, at Mm -hmm. least among the city leaders, the way it should have been. You know, I had a conversation yesterday at the Senate prayer breakfast. Tim Scott from South Carolina was talking about what happened in Charleston, you know, uh, uh, three years ago when, when Dylan Roof killed nine people at the church and how that entire state came together and how people worked together to try to change the hearts and minds. And they did so over a 36 hour period and it really helped change that. That was a lot slower to come in Birmingham because a lot of the city leaders, they didn't go to the funerals, Mm -hmm. they expressed their grief, but they didn't go to the funerals and and they really kind of wanted to forget about it and make sure that we kind of move forward. And that that was something that I think it took a a while for Birmingham to overcome. Was there any kind of show of support or sense of complicity, perhaps, from the white community in Birmingham at the time? There was certainly, there were a number of, of ministers who came to the funerals, expressed support for the families, to support for the community to try to make Birmingham a better place. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. But in terms of the contriteness or blame, I don't think Birmingham fully did that. In fact, there was one of the great lawyers out of Alabama named Chuck Morgan who gave a speech the day after. He was one of the young lawyers who were trying to change Birmingham and and as a young progressive lawyer trying to make Birmingham a much better place gave a speech to the Young Men's Business Club in which he did acknowledge that it was the, you know, it was the old adage of bad things happen when when good men do nothing, Mm -hmm. and essentially pointed the finger back at the white community, the city leaders, the business leaders, the social leaders, and said, we are really to blame for allowing this to happen because we stood back and did nothing. And that was not met on very favorable terms. He received death threats. 
and ultimately moved out of Birmingham. Wow. But, but I want to quickly add this. I think over the years, though, that has changed so dramatically in, in my city and all for the positive. Let's talk about the investigation of the crime and the prosecution at that time. Well, the investigation was pretty amazing. There was no prosecution at the time in the 60s. The investigation was pretty remarkable. I mean, they did an amazing job. People forget sometimes that you can't always solve every homicide. There is a lot of homicides in this country that have remained unsolved. But the FBI came in, did a uh, had boots on the ground, forensics. I, I think they took down every lead, tracked down every lead they could possibly do. They had electronic surveillance out there. They just couldn't quite make it. Now, that is in contrast to the state authorities. State authorities at that time when Governor Wallace, you know, George Wallace was still the governor, mm-hmm. they really spent a lot of effort trying to prove that the African-American community set that bomb to try to get sympathy for their cause, wow. which is just an absurd, absolutely absurd view. But that's that's what they did. It, it, unfortunately, in federal court, the statute of limitations was only five years for a civil rights violation in which a death occurred. That didn't change until the 1990s. And so the case, as far as the federal government was closed, in 1968 and reopened by state authorities in 1971. Well, we know now who it was who committed this crime. Let's talk a little bit about those men and what they did. Well, they were pretty evil men. I like to say they just weren't warm-blooded animals. They had ice water in their veins. They were part of the Klan. And there was, in Alabama at the time and throughout areas in the South, the Klan had various chapters. They called them claverns. And there were a lot in and around Birmingham and Jefferson County, where Birmingham is located. And these guys were members of a particularly violent group called Eastview 13. They met, uh, ironically enough, at the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge in Birmingham. But even that group, as violent as they were, there was a splinter group, and they would meet underneath a, a bridge, and that's where so much of the bomb plot was hatched. We had a lot of information about that, most of it informant information that would not be used at trials, but a lot of information about how that was done. And these guys were just evil men. They didn't see the world as anything other than a white, Christian, Protestant world of people that look like them, talk like them, or, or even practice a different religion than them. We're just off and, and they wanted to try to do everything they can to preserve their way of life. And that's where this bomb plot was hatched. There was a lot of information that we had about that. On what basis, what evidence did the Attorney General William Baxley in 1977 reopen this case? The evidence was fairly slim. He was elected in 1970, and he was in law school when the bombing happened, and it really affected him as a young law student, and he vowed to look into it if he ever had the opportunity. So I don't think there was a lot of new evidence that came out. And in fact, his office was stonewalled a good bit by the FBI until he enlisted the help of a a Los Angeles Times reporter named Jack Nelson. And they started giving information with the FBI at that point. And what he did was he just pieced together information that was available at the time. One came from Chambliss's niece, Mm -hmm. who there was an incident that happened right the weekend before the bombing, and she testified about Chambliss, had already told her that he had enough dynamite to flatten half of Birmingham. And then on that Friday, he is looking at the television about this one racial incident, and he's saying, you just wait until Sunday, and they will beg us to segregate. And then on another occasion, a week later, When there was a news uh, uh, on the television about it, he is very pensive as saying, well, the bomb didn't go off. No one was supposed to get killed or hurt. The bomb didn't go off when it was supposed to. You had that testimony. You had some pieces of that puzzle. There was another lady who saw a lot of dynamite at the Chambliss residence. So it was those pieces that got put together by Bill enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Robert Chambliss was guilty. They convicted him. Then Baxley went out of office, and it did not get picked up again until my investigation. When I took office in 1997, it had been ongoing for a few months. Did you know you wanted to reopen this case when you took that position? 
You know, at the, at the time, the, the case uh, was not on my particular radar. It was, there were so many things when you're trying to become a, a U.S. attorney and you're looking at the issues of the day. I mean, we had an issue with public corruption and white collar crime was a big issue. We were still dealing with drug issues that we were trying to do and there were drug task force that we were working. So as I'm, I'm, I'm working my nomination through, I'm really focused on the issues that are facing the office on a daily basis that are ongoing. And then one morning I woke up and I go out to pick up the newspaper and I see that this case had been reopened and I was, it had been open for several months. It just sent a chill up and down me and I told my wife about it. And, and at that point you knew that there is just something that is just working in everyone's favor, that, that I'm going to be at the right place at the right time to try to do one of two things, because we had no idea whether or not we could ever be successful. But I knew that we had to try. I knew that time was running out. I knew there was a lot of people who did not know the full extent of the FBI investigation. And because of J. Edgar Hoover's reputation, they didn't believe the FBI had done a great job. And I wanted to make sure that the community understood that we were going to do everything that we could to try to bring these killers to justice. The second thing is trying to do it and being successful, which was just amazing. So at this point, of the five people who set off that bomb, two are dead, one is convicted, two are remaining. You then successfully prosecuted them or part of the team in 2001 and 2002. What were those trials like? We indicted Tommy Blanton and Bobby Frank Cherry in state court. Even though I was U.S. attorney, the statute of limitations to run because we had 1963 law. We indicted them in state court. At the last minute, Cherry filed a motion claiming he had dementia, which we later proved he was just faking. But we had to separate the trial. So we had two cases. One in 2001 against Tommy Blanton, and we convicted him. The other in 2002. It was the kind of thing I wish every lawyer could have a case that meant so much to so many people. I think I didn't fully appreciate the depth of feeling in Alabama and around the country about bringing those killers to justice for the death of those four girls. And we had an incredibly dedicated team that put it together. We put pieces of the puzzle that we had from old evidence, and then we were able to develop new evidence, particularly on Cherry, who made admissions over the years and bragging about being involved in these bombings. It was just remarkable. Like I said, I wish every lawyer could have that opportunity. What were the reactions, I'm sure, and in your interactions with the family members of those four girls who were still living? Well, we became very close. I had known the McNair family for many years, Chris McNair and Maxine, who are still alive today. Uh, they're in their 90s and not in good health, but they were had known that family for a long, long time. I got to know Miss Robertson, Carol Robertson's mom, and she was just an incredible person. I consciously did not get too close to them until we knew we were going to indict the cases mm-hmm. because I wanted to remain objective. But we had an incredible uh, support. You know, I say all the time that these family members had this abiding faith in our system of justice that sooner or later justice would be done. And they, they worked and they waited and they were patient and they were incredibly supportive. They were there every day supporting us. And it was so gratifying. For them, I still have a, I have a painting that my jury consultant, Andy Sheldon from Atlanta, did of me bending down with Miss Robertson because that's the kind of relationship that you develop with them. And I was so happy for them as much as I was for our team and our community. I think one of the big questions that many people will have is how could it possibly have taken so long from that bombing in 1963 to 2001, 2002? to bring these men to justice? It's a very good question, and I don't really have a great answer for it. I think that often, especially when statute of limitations close, as we discussed earlier, the state was not going to, on its own, do something from the day. And when Bill Baxley left office, of people that followed him didn't have the political will to do it. Bill had the political courage to do it in 1977. And there were some things that changed. I mean, there were things, obviously, Birmingham changed, our community changed, a a jury changed. We would, you know, they could have presented the same evidence that we had in the 1960s, and they were not likely to get a conviction with white men at Mm -hmm. that time. And that was part of Hoover's argument, too, right, at the time? That's correct. He, He did not believe, and I think he was correct. I mean, I got a lot of faults 
with J. Edgar Hoover, but I think he was absolutely correct on that, that they would not have been able because, you know, we had a tape recording of Tommy Blanton and his then wife. I'm not sure you could have gotten that into evidence. The uh, informant testimony could have been attacked, even if they would have agreed to testify. Mm -hmm. It was very suspect. And then once the cases kind of got closed, and after Baxley's case, there was a, a sense, I think, among many law enforcement in the community, okay, we've, we've done what we needed to do, but it was never satisfactory to the African-American community. And in the 90s, they asked the FBI to take a look at it. By this time, you had seen a couple of cases reopened. In Mississippi, you had Byron De La Beckwith, who was convicted for the murder of Medgar Evers, and you had Sam Bowers convicted for the murder of Vernon Damer, and all in the 1960s. And I think a new generation of prosecutors and investigators looked at this and said, you can go back. You can do this. We've got new jurors. We've got new ways of looking at this and piecing it together. So it was a really a combination of things and that caused it to really be pulled off the shelf and taken another look at. When Attorney General William Baxley brought this case to trial in 1977 for Chambliss and succeeded in prosecuting him, afterwards he ran for governor and lost. And part of that loss was blamed on the sort of political ramifications of having stood up to the right. Klan. And he was not the only person who suffered negative repercussions politically or otherwise for having been on that side. When you ran for the Senate in 2017 in a special election to replace Jeff Sessions against Roy Moore. Was there any resurfacing of your role in the trial of the two final criminals in this case? Oh, certainly. There was resurfacing, but all in a positive way. We never felt any blowback. We didn't worry about it. We talked about it because it helped define me and if you've got something that helps define a candidate the way those cases define me, you have no choice. But it was something we were very proud of. Well, that's certainly a sign of some positive change. Senator Jones, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. And, and I hope your listeners enjoy the podcast and enjoy the book. All right. The book again is called Bending Toward Justice, The Birmingham Church Bombing That Changed the Course of Civil Rights by Senator Doug Jones with Greg Truman. Doug, thanks again for being here. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Alexandra Alter joins us now with some news from the publishing world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. So we're all sitting back and reading the full Mueller report, right? Yes. The hottest book right now to read is the Mueller report. Unfortunately, we're not. It's not available, but that hasn't stopped publishers from promising to publish it quite soon. Already there was Skyhorse and Scribner. They had plans to release the Mueller report. It's even available for presale on Amazon that was before Mueller even produced the report and submitted it to the Department of Justice. In the time since, a couple of other publishers have jumped in. Melville House says that they will be publishing the unabridged Mueller report as soon as possible upon its release to the public. The placeholder they've put in is April 16th. That might be a bit optimistic given the the clash that we're seeing between Democratic elected leaders who have demanded the full report and Bill Barr, the attorney general, who has said – so far, he's not planning to provide that. He's he's going to provide a redacted version or possibly another summary. So it looks like there's going to be a fight over this, and it will take a while. But publishers are absolutely and not surprisingly chomping at the bit to get a copy and get it out there. Audible has also said that they will record it and release it as a free download, wow. which is pretty interesting. That Who is interesting. Think to narrate it? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, Robert De Niro has played him on Saturday Night Live, I think, played Bob Mueller, but I don't know if he's the exact right voice for this. <laughs> but you can imagine the fact that there's already this debate over what's in the report, what Bob Mueller really intended. Did he really mean to kick over the question of whether or not President Trump or his associates obstructed justice to the attorney general, or did he want to go to Congress? How do you interpret it? There's already, you know, a real partisan fight over it. So I can imagine if and when the full report is available, it would be a huge seller because it's not one of those situations where, you know, in the past there have been public releases of, of big, juicy reports and there hasn't been necessarily this rush to read them because you feel like this all came out in congressional hearings or I've heard the newscasters sort of put their spin on it and it was pretty clear cut. Mm -hmm. I think this is a case where people really want to see the nitty gritty They want to decide themselves. for themselves. Yeah. yeah. And there's enough ambiguity right now around it 
that I think people are really eager to make those determinations, not just elected leaders, but the public. So I think it's smart if they can, in fact, get access to the document to publish it. I think it's also a public service. So it'll be interesting to see how things progress. All right. Publishers are not the only ones chomping at the bit. No, Thanks, Alexandra. Not at all. Thanks for having me. Our critics join us now to talk about what they've read this week. Dwight Garner, Jen Salai, and Carl Sagal. Hi, guys. Hey, Pamela. Hey, Pamela. Hi, Pamela. All right, let's start with you, Dwight. You loved a book. Oh, man, did I love a book. You know, critics aren't supposed to deal with superlatives. You know, we're supposed to sort of, uh, you know, explicate things and, and make fine distinctions. And, and But sometimes you read something, you just want to sort of shout it out. And I read this novel this week called The Old Drift by a first novelist. She's born in Zambia. Her name is Namwali Serpel, if I'm getting that correctly. And it's a multi-generational epic set largely in, in, in Zambia, formerly part of Rhodesia, northern Rhodesia. And when I hear the word multi-generational epic, I often want to run. <laughs> I just, it's, you know, I, not that they can't be very good, but I, it doesn't always send the best signals to me anyway, based on my former reading. And it's kind of booked also that has a cast of characters in the front, and family trees, and, 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 and other things that warn you to sort of, here may be dragons, you know. And yet, from the very word go, she's clearly spent many, many, many years working on this. And, and every character is just so closely observed. She has so much to say about so many aspects of the world, you know, from politics to technology, race. And it's a female epic in the sense, um, matrilineal, it, it follows sort of grandmothers, daughters, and mothers over the course of about 100 years. And all of them are just fascinating. None of them are put on pedestals. There's a bit of magical realism in the novel. People are comparing it to, and I think these comparisons are pretty accurate, to Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children and Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. And there's a bit of that, but not, not so much. And it's sort of one of those books that has a lot to say about the culture and where we are now, but also is alive on a sentence-to-sentence human level. The mosquitoes talk as well. There's a there's a little chorus, a, a, a Greek chorus, a, a pipsqueak chorus, I call it in my review. The mosquitoes come in once about every 75 pages and sort of mock the follies That's of man. That's very they like, yeah. Yeah, and the mosquitoes are hilarious. They sort of buzz in and out. You know, it's one of those big, sprawling books, and yet it's crackling. You know, it's got a real sensibility. Question, do you think there's still, like, an appetite for these kinds of big family epics the way there was in the 90s? No, people love them, do you remember? But I'm trying to think, like, what was the last one that really got people excited and entered the conversation in a big way? That's a very good question. For me, like, I think a suitable boy, which was like, wow, what, the like 97, 96? No, earlier than that, was I it? think. I think so. I remember when I was coming of age as a reader and, and I wanted to sort of start reading quote unquote adult books when right. I was maybe 12, 13. Maybe younger, maybe eleven, and all the all the my friends, my parents, my parents read those huge all epic of them. Leon Uris, Leon Uris, this, yeah. even like John Jakes mm-hmm. and Taylor Caldwell, mm-hmm. and all these. And there was like a sex scene in these, like every reliably every mm-hmm. twenty nine pages. You yeah, know? that was in, the in novel. Of these. Yeah, that was. But I, I I thought that was what adults read. You know, <laughs> only <laughs> that I found out later this this stuff was not so great. Most of it. But anyway, she's written this this very large book, and I I, I get the sense she's worked on it for more than a decade, and you can tell. I mean, it's just so well written in in, in little packets along the way that it's clearly this has just been thought over and revised forever and it's just pretty great i always wonder how writers exist after they've written a book that they've lived inside of for 10 years are they like sort of mollusks without their shells i do like, too that's it, a it, place they, they must feel homeless and so few of us <laughs> you're right. so right and so few writers now can go that long without publishing i mean she's kind of been under the radar she probably could have written three books by now if she right. wanted to and i think she's she's kept her head down and worked on this this epic for a very long time. She's been writing around quite a bit, though, now. I think yeah, she had a piece in, in Slate, and she wrote an essay for, for us for, about, for about science fiction. Yeah. This A Suitable Boy, I've just checked with my electronic companion, was published in 1993. Oh, my God. Wow. Yes. Wow. Time. I've never read that book. Oh, I think I should so go back good. and read it. Oh, it's fantastic. You know, I only read an earlier book by him called From Heaven Lake, which was a travel book that took place, I think, mostly in China. And misled me to travel to Heaven Lake at the oh time. My God. Yes, yes. Which I went in the wrong season, so it Books didn't that end give well. Bad advice is a special <laughs> category oh, dear to a me. Whole <laughs> other conversation. I think a lot of these epics. I was reading something about Delillo the other day, and that someone wrote that you know everyone picked up Underworld, which is what nine hundred pages, eight hundred fifty, and everyone read the opening section with their sort of mouths open, going, "Oh my God!" And everyone sort of walked away from it about <laughs> seventy-four pages later. And I'm not sure that's true, but I, I but I know a lot of people who who pick up these kind of epics and just can't quite make it through them. And I, I think this, in Dillo's case, and in this case as well, you probably should. Well, these days, Kindle tells on you if you do that. 
Oh, how does that work? It, they they know how far you go into the book, apparently. That's so cruel. Yes, yes. <laughs> I hope they don't report it back to the authors. So do we. We don't tell our readers. We know how far <laughs> they've made it in the books we review. All right, Jen, what did you review? So this week I reviewed a book called Hattiesburg, An American Story in Black and White by an historian at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, named William Sturkey. And it's about a Mississippi town that was founded in 1882, so shortly after Reconstruction ended. And he follows its history through Jim Crow and up until the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. And what he wants to show, he he wants to be very clear on the horrors of Jim Crow, but he also wants to show in close-up how segregation worked in this town and also how it had some unintended and surprising consequences. So this is a really intimate history. He alternates the chapters between the personal histories of the black residents and the white residents. And he really shows how, you know, for example, for the white power brokers in town, how they were navigating this changing national economy and how in order to do that, they actually had to make some subtle alterations to the racial hierarchy that they were still trying to uphold that ended up, you know, not necessarily obviously ending Jim Crow. They didn't want to do that, but opening the door in a way and sowing the seeds of its own destruction. And for the black residents who really had to contend with the daily terrors of lynching or the threat of lynching, so, you know, he's very clear on that. They also, because of this you know, very rigid system put in place, they were forced to forge their own communal institutions and organizations and, you know, really focus on things like the church and sort of build up this system that when the time came, when things were possible, or at least more possible, this was really sort of the organizational groundwork for the civil rights movement. He tells the story pretty straight. There's a few places, I couldn't get into it in the review, where He can be quite arch when he points to some of the really extreme, absurd manifestations of hypocrisy, for instance, in the history that he's telling. But for the most part, he tells it straight. He tells it very clearly. He knows which details to marshal. I found it really quite illuminating. Is he in the book or does he sort of report it like a historian? No, he reports it as a historian. I think his experience with the town, from what I could tell, he might have taught there at some point. But... It's not like he's injecting a personal history into this. Carl, what did you review this week? I reviewed uh, a new book by David Shields called The Trouble with Men. And big, broad diagnostic title. It is actually more what is the trouble with David Shields. And (laughs) Shields is a writer who I've admired, but I've also, I find deeply annoying. Uh, He's written a bunch of manifestos, Not My Thing, Reality Hunger, How Literature Saved My Life. Sorry, I think it's How Literature Can Save Your Life. Not sure. But really, he means his life. His life. (laughs) (laughs) The ongoing confusion between we and me with David Shields. Um, So I picked up this book, and it's very slim. It's from a small press, Ohio State Press. And I picked it up. I kind of, like, flipped through it. And then I had this feeling, which I'm sure we've all had. It just nagged at me. Like, I just kept Mm -hmm. thinking about it. And I was, like, looking at other books. And I was like, okay, I'll do this. But I had something about it. And I kept returning to it. And I think that there is something... Just when we're in the presence of actual candor, it is always arresting. And so the book is, where does one begin? It's, the book is, it's a story of Shields' marriage, of Shields' sexual relationship with his wife, and more broadly, his attraction to humiliation of all kinds. <laughs> and so, you so know, there's no way to negatively review this and have it hurt him. <laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is, is just like, the, the, the thing about this book and the thing about, and I started to think about how we talk about writing about sex. There's such a temptation to be kind of detached and sneering. And Shields actually does write from this point of view of genuine curiosity, vulnerability, honesty about himself and his desires and his marriage. I mean, God knows how he was allowed. Somebody gave him a very long leash, (laughs) apparently. But I, I was actually rather moved by it. I think he's 65 now. And sort of just looking at his life and saying, why do I want what I want? Isn't it a little bit ridiculous? And he's actually funny for the first time, which you have to be when you're writing about, I think, sex and marriage and the self in general. But 
So for the first time I read this, I was like, you're actually good company in, in, in the course of this book. And I felt like it was his most sort of revealing book and in its own way, just, yeah, I don't know. It, it made me think and it made me just realize what he can do on the page. What I want to read now, Parl, is an essay by you called The Ongoing Confusion Between We and Me. <laughs> Please? <laughs> That's where I'm left. <laughs> All right, let's run down the books again. The Old Drift by Namwali Serpel. Hattiesburg, An American Story in Black and White by William Sturkey. And The Trouble with Men by David Shields. All right, thanks, guys. Thank thanks. You. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back. Albeit not right away. The Book Review Podcast is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with the great help of my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul.